Well, here he is, the the, the wandering minstrel, uh, Mark Selby. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Yeah, back from a few weeks of holiday, so I was able to take a little bit of downtime, which is nice, but uh, it's nice to come back to nickel prices, sitting above $9 a pound, as uh, we had discussed that it might break through this fall. So it's good, good to see you finally often. make you should get a holiday more often if that happens. There you go, exactly. That'll just be what it takes to get it through ten dollars. But no, sadly, that won't be till probably till year end or early next year. So, right. Well, like, um, like we're, we're glad you're back. Um, gonna gonna keep these updates going. Things are moving. We're gonna talk about some of the companies out there and what they've been up to, um, and probably do a little bit more of that next week too. So, when, when you give us a kind of um, quick, quick uh, catch up on, on the world of Nicholson, since uh, you've been away. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as we've been talking through the summer that it was going to take a few whacks to kind of get through $9 a pound, it kind of touched there a few times. It finally broke through. And as again, as typical, when it breaks through a support level, it, you know, it generally pops, you know, quite a bit above that. So got as high as 9.35 a pound. Um, uh, you know, this morning was back up that towards those levels. And then it's traded down this afternoon to just over $9 a pound. Um, and, and again, I think we'll see a trade now in this nine to $10 a pound or 20 to $22,000 a ton for those of you uh, who, who uh, look at metal prices in, on a per ton basis. Uh, the reason being t- $10 a pound, if you go back in the charts over a long period of time, you know, that's been a big support resistance level during the, that prior nickel boom. But, you know, this is the highest price for nickel that we've seen since 2014. Uh, and again, it's, you know, been pretty fundamental driven. We've seen continued declines. Uh, in LME inventories since the last time I was on a few weeks ago for holidays, uh, you know, inventories are down by 20,000 tons or nearly 10% uh, on the LME, you know, which is, which is pretty, pretty meaningful. And then, you know, again, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, fundamentally in China, you know, things are very, very strong um, in terms of, you know, ore prices moving in the right direction, stainless prices moving back up, sulfate prices, prices are, you know, trading sideways, but they were, they were at a crazy premium before those premiums are coming in a little bit, but, you know, fundamentally we're seeing, you know, real strength across the board. So, you know, not surprised, you know, to see, see Nick nickel make it through, um, you know, and despite <laughs> Elon Musk and Ching Shen's best efforts to try and talk down the price. I saw that that's where, with regards to LFP batteries, um, make, making comments. I thought he was your friend. I thought so too, but, uh, obviously you know, I, I think, um, you know, getting a little ner- nervous about nickel supply and trying to dampen down some of the momentum in the story. So, again, if you've been watching us talk about it, you know, I've been, uh, you know, pretty vocal. Say, look, at, you know, there are certain market applications that are ideal for LFP. It's silly to use nickel in, in those applications. Nickel is going to end up used in the long range, you know, high energy intensity uh, applications that it needed for. We just simply don't have enough nickel out by 2025, 2030, you know, to, to have nickel batteries in, in every single application uh, that's there. So you, you will see this, you know, LFP um, uh, and high nickel battery bifurcation that's happened, you know, and, and again, you know, we're already seeing that, you know, just in the most recent stats, uh, you know, you've got, you know, EV forecast for the year, most people are up to 80% plus. Um, and in terms of the split, what's happened is you've seen, you know, before you had batteries that were one third nickel, 50 percent nickel, 60 percent nickel. The, the nickel use in those is, has pretty much collapsed. And you've seen an increase in LFP batteries that have no nickel. And then you've seen an increase uh, in batteries that are 80 to 90 percent nickel. You know, and, and that's what you know, we expect to see uh, going forward. You know, again, if nickel prices continue to move higher, we'll see, you know, if a new nickel battery type emerges, you know, Tesla, uh, more than a year ago, had talked about nickel manganese um, as a potential mid-range battery. We'll, so we'll see if there's some sort of nickel battery type that emerges somewhere between those two uses. Um, but again, that'll be consumer driven that, you know, there's an application that doesn't quite need that little extra nickel, but still needs enough nickel to get to get the range and, and energy density that's required. So, so I'm surprised that usually when Elon Musk says something, the market like just go, swings that way, right? So here we didn't see much of a move. And I appreciate the, you know, the EV component of nickel sales today is, you know, insignificant, but it, it's it's where it's going that get gets people talking here. So do you think that the market understands those different use cases as you just outlined, or do you just think that actually the, the momentum of the market is, is, is going and even Elon can't change that trajectory? Yeah, no, I, I think it's the latter. You know, again, I think I'm shocked. No, again, not shocked. I, again, I'm always, you know, 
always amazed at how many professional traders have such little fundamental understanding of the market. But I, but I think you know the difference now from say March when Ching Shan dropped the first bomb on on the nickel market, trying to you know dent the momentum and prices fell by a dollar, you know, and stayed down for several months. You know, in this case, you know, one of the tweets Elon Musk put out was last Friday afternoon. You know, LME, you know, it was just near the LME close and prices fell down 10 cents. And by Monday morning, you know, it, it had roared right back again. And, and I think it is there's there's now enough, uh, enough understanding of the fundamentals and then enough data points over five or six months now that, you know, the traders are back there with with some real conviction. Um, and, and I think we're kind of starting to see through a little bit of the of some of these moves as just trying to talk the market down, um, you know, rather than any anything that's going to have a real material impact on the medium and long term story, which, you know, again, I think is, you know, it's just if, if anything's gotten you know, much stronger, given the momentum we've seen so far this year. I, I, which I think is great news. I think that the more reality in this uh, market, the better. More fundamentals, more data, less sentiment. It can only be a good thing. And if you're an investor, then you really need to think like that now. Because think it's not just uh, nickel we're seeing that in, but there, there's several other commodities which are people just suddenly waking up to the fact. Um, well, I, I, should, we, should we talk a little bit about, because you, 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 you give us a little bit on China, which is fine. So and I know you're tight for times. Shall we talk yep. about some of the company uh, stories that are out there at the moment? Um, we, one we've talked about previously, BHP, Wilo. Uh, it's not a done deal. He's no. fighting back. They came back. Andrew Forrest reached deep into his pocket, pocket and pulled out another $100 million plus. Um, so, so, again, this was a stock 18 months ago. It was 12 cents. Uh, a resource capital fund uh, was a 30% owner. They, they were winding up the fund that, that held that stock. They marketed it like crazy. Uh, Wailu bought it, um, I think, for $0.20 cents a share. Uh, they started this bidding war at $0.30. Cents. BHP came in at $0.55, and now Wailu's countered at $0.75. Cents, you know, and as of the end of last week, you've seen uh, you know, Norwich shares trading north of $0.80. Cents. So I think you know, uh, people believe that BHP are going to come back you know, once again uh, you know, to top the bid. I would say personally, I think it's a 50-50 outcome. Uh, I, you know, if if Y Lu didn't own the 30% stake, then I think if BHP is prepared to pay 55, you know, they, they will, you know, they're not going to be outdone by Andrew Forrest. Um, but you know, you can normally you you know, if somebody owned 30%, you wouldn't come in and and try and top someone who's got such a sort of a, unless you're a BHP, you know, come in and try and top someone who's got such a big stake uh, to start with. So. Um, so I would say it's 50, 50, you know, again, it's personal, you know, BHP and forced to go back to Northwest Australia, iron ore deals where, you know, BHP tried to elbow them out a little bit back in that time period. So, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. And again, from, from a, a nickel project owner perspective, um, you know, which Canada nickel is, you know, it's, it is, it's amazing to see, you know, this early again, I didn't really see if you've watched our presentations, I wasn't expecting a lot of fireworks to happen until, until the end of this year, early next year. So it's great to see, you know, this battle ending. And again, all those Noron short shareholders, uh, you know, who bought it mostly for the nickel, some for the chrome, but, you know, the nickel was the value there. And so, you know, as soon as that, you know, it's clear that there's going to be a takeout winner, all of that cash uh, that just got generated by these shareholders are going to be looking for a new nickel home. So, um, you know, I, so I think a lot of them are going to end up coming, you know, Canada Nichols way, which will be great. Two things, two immediate thoughts yep. on that one. Okay, Forrester, Andrew Forrester, smart move to go in with another another bid, and you know, whether it should be seventy five or 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 lower, or whether it should be seventy five or higher, I, I I don't I don't know, but he's got a it's a win win for him, isn't it? Because even if B, if BP come back in. Forrester's made it made made a few probably a couple hundred million uh, bucks out of uh, BHP coming back in, or if BHP don't come back in, he gets the project that he wanted, potentially, right? That, yeah. that, so you could say that's a win win. But yeah. why would anyone want that project? It's sitting in a swampland. There's more water there than. I think any sensible CEO would would want to see in the middle of nowhere. This is coming from a CEO who I spoke to. Let's let's make this uh, harder for the work out here. It is in the last couple of weeks, he knows a thing or two about nickel. It's not you. Someone said.
this is in the middle of nowhere. People need to understand that the infrastructure cost to get this thing going is going to be phenomenal, and even for a BHP. So why are people fighting it out for swampland? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it uh, it it really is. And again, I mean, the, sort of the you know the Florida swamp sales back in the 1900s. I mean, you're not that far away. I mean, this is you know real basically millions of square miles, square miles, square kilometers of of basically James Bay lowland bog, and and this thing is you know several hundred kilometers from the nearest nearest uh, transport point. Uh, you know, I think that the, what what it does it just re, you know we again we've talked about the scarcity of nickel sulfide assets um, globally um, and the lack of any real, very few nickel assets outside of Indonesia. And so, you know, why Lou grabbed uh, the, that West Raglan project that Orford Mining uh, has, and, and they, they're gonna earn into that, you know, again, Orford has a stake, in, you know, that, that pro- project that Orford has is better than what, uh, you know, my view in terms of the expiration potential than, than what Norant has. And, and uh, you know, Nor- uh, Orford will still own 20% of it at the end of, of, of uh, Wailu uh, earning in. Um, but yeah, there are just really, really very few, few nickel assets out there. And, and Wailu grabbing that one and then, and then Noron basically took the two decent high-grade nickel exploration stories out there. And, you know, again, you know, BHP is staffing up this office in Toronto as a nickel exploration office. And so, you know, again, you know, from, from another nickel project holder in Canada, a couple hundred miles to the east with a lot of infrastructure around, you know, um, you know, we're pretty excited to, to, to see all that activity. And, and just, again, underscoring just, just you know, just the uh, shortage of good nickel assets out there. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I just want to see how that, that plays out, whether, for, whether you know, Wiley come out on top of BHP come out on top. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued to see some more work done on the economics ar- around that um, and what price Nickel's going to have to get to for, for that project to, to work. And I say you, comparison to Canada Nickel is, is, uh, is noted. Um, shall, we, shall we talk about, shall we go to Russia? Let's go to Russia, because yeah. we, we're going to talk about the uh, first exchange traded commodity physically backed by carbon neutral nickel, no less. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so Norilsk uh, announced earlier that they were going to take a portion of their production that they could justify as being uh, zero carbon and start to have it as a zero carbon product. Uh, I haven't seen any published premium data on that, but again, as a potential zero carbon nickel producer, pretty keen to see you know how that play, plays out. Uh, but again, you know they they've established uh, look at establishing these exchange traded funds because again, from a from a commodity perspective, you know when you end up parking a bunch of physical metal in within one of these funds, you know it it, it you know really does help tighten up uh, you know the market from time to time. You know again, you know as uh, in uranium and some other commodities, you know that that exchange traded fund becomes a a pretty sizable portion of of uh, you know current supply. So. You know, it's it's interesting to see you know Norilsk you know get, getting quite involved in that, and then again having having some of that nickel potentially get you know pulled off the market, you know even as it's just getting produced. It's yeah. Well, I, I'm also intrigued to see if there'll be any. Well, how many more of the, these there will um, be? Um, you know, because this narrative is not going away. We're seeing the rise of a lot more sort of these uh, service companies. Uh, advising companies on how they can take advantage of it. So, I mean, it, you know, you you obviously started your um, zero carbon uh, initiative as well. I mean, how's, how's that going? Oh, it's great. I mean, we're we're doing the doing the work now in terms of you know quantifying exactly how much carbon uh, our tailings and waste rock can absorb. You know, we published you know our carbon footprint post our PEA, uh, and again, you know. Starting day one, we are designing the mine to be as low as as low carbon as possible. Not surprisingly, you know, we fared pretty well with that. And then, you know, we'll be calculating, doing this work to figure out how much of an offset our tailings and waste rock can generate. And that, you know, that that uh, you know that work is going very, very, very well. So, yeah, but you've made from theory that because again, a few companies have talked about the theory of doing that. You're, you're, this is actually meaningfully advancing. And I mean, are you having people you know, come and talk to you about that? And I'm talking about in terms of institutions, how much do they actually care, or is it just at the end of the day, you know, how the economics of the company work? Uh, I think, I, I mean, t- again, I don't think they're. Um, so far, you know, it's a they're interested in the fact that we are focused on lower carbon, whether they 
get into the next level of detail to really understand it. You know, yeah. that's, I'm been surprised actually sort of at the sort of that lack of depth in, in some of, just in, in some of that. So yeah, it's tick, just a, a tick the box. Little bit. Yeah. Man, so, that's such a shame. Yeah. That's such yeah. a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I think I, I spoke to you, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my, my, my friend, Julio, he's a fund manager. He said that it's literally 50% of their funds have converted into, you know, you know, kind of greenwashed, version of ESG compliance. And he said, it's a tick box. Don't really care, but it looks good to our customers. It's just a shame. Yeah. No, I mean, for the ones of us that are actually doing the real work, it'd yep. be nice, nice if they did. The other, the other interesting story around Neuralsk this week, um, which, which harkened back to the, one of the last big takeover battles. So uh, Neuralsk announced this week, they've come up with a new technology to basically extract nickel, copper and PGMs from these tailings that they have. Uh, and the reason that's important was back in 2007, you know, a company called Lion Ore, um, which was a standalone nickel sulfide producer, uh, was the subject of a, of a bidding battle um, between Extrata and Norilsk um, that eventually ended up north of $5 billion US uh, for this company. And one of the key parts of that deal, and I actually made a, a hedge fund who was advising at that time, a pile of money, as I said, no, Norilsk really wants their technology called at that time called Activox uh, to be able to extract the PGMs because um, there's just so much sulfur in this material and so little nickel, even though there was, you know, again, sort of a, but a quarter of an ounce of, of PGMs in them. Um, they really wanted that technology. And sure enough, they did come back and ended up buying the company. Uh, on, uh, and sadly, with a lot of nickel technology, it didn't end up working. Um, and <laughs> hence, the tailings are still there. And Nerwilsk, um, you know, is now developing some new technology to try and tap into to that material that's there. So I had a little chuckle of myself when I when I saw that I uh, news came across. So because I, I, I love that, because we you know we talked and joked in the past about sort of retread stories and people coming up with new technologies to solve crack problems which could not be solved before. So even the big boys suffer. Even the big guys. Oh yeah, no, no. It's 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 you know uh, again uh, for investors out there, you know, if it hasn't been done before, there's usually a reason why. Um, you know, and again, that's just not to say people you know aren't able to to do it, but um, you know, it's 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 always always um, you know tread with a little bit of caution again, which I think is a good segue <laughs> into the next story. Uh, yeah, not not bad. So we're 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 gonna um, sort of trot off to Brazil now, aren't we? Yes. So Brazilian company called Brazilian Nickel. Nickel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Came from the same firm that we used to come up with our name for uh, Canada Nickel. <laughs> what um, I was about to say, you stole my joke, honestly. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So they're looking at doing a heap leach nickel project um, on a project that was uh, formerly owned by Valet, who was looking at as a, as a pressure leach. Um, uh, you know, I, again, this is now th this is a group, a lot of the management team that's involved um, was involved uh, in, with, in a project in Turkey uh, called Chaldag um, in the mid 2000s. Um, they did get quite a bit down the path. Unfortunately for them, um, there was, you know, they got really got caught up in a forestry permitting issue um, in 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 the area that they were in in Turkey, which, you know, again, partly actual environmental, partly, I think, local business interests trying to strong arm their way into a particular project. Um, so, um, you know, heap, you know, heap leaching has, has, hasn't been successfully really done um, at, at much scale, but, you know, they're working their way through it. So they had a demonstration plant. They're just raising money now to get to about 1,500 tons of nickel a year, um, which is, you know, sort of a, like a, starting to get to commercial scale uh, demonstration pilot plant. So, um, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. And, and again, you know, we need new ways to get nickel, uh, nickel out of the ground and, and uh, you know, help unlock it. So, you know, we'll be curious to see, see how that goes. You know, one of the biggest challenges with a lot of nickel laterites is you, the reason laterites get formed is you have massive amounts of rain, um, which, you know, helps to leach the nickel out of the ground, um, you know, Heap leaches don't always work in areas where you get massive amounts of rain. It tends to dilute the, uh, the, the grade. So if the laterite deposit got moved to a drier location, then, you know, the, then that, that potential, you know, is definitely there. So, you know, we'll, you know, I think it's, you know, this is one worth keeping an eye on to see how it goes. Um, and, uh, you know, if and when that comes to market. Okay, well, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't actually, I haven't actually heard of them. Um, RCF involved that as well, well weren't they? Wh which one? Oh, yeah, with the Brazilian RCF nickel, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. RCF came into that one, although you know, to be honest, um, 
uh, and I'm, I'm just doing this because RCF hasn't, they don't like low grade nickel sulfides. Um, so, but they invested in a bunch of other sulfides. Uh, they invested in Mirabella, first nickel, um, you know, but which both went bankrupt and then they cashed out Noront just before this massive move higher. So, you know, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, there's sometimes endorsement investors and, you know, then there's yeah. real quotation endorsement investors. So we'll see, we'll see right. what happens. There. Right. And sorry right. to anybody at RCF about that dig, but, you know. No, RCF, I would say RCF uh, generally superb investing, good, good, good teams, good diligence teams. They, they, what? they get it right a lot of the time. So, yeah. The, they oh, the, yeah. They, they do and, and better than average. And I think the thing that's here is, one of the things is they don't they don't typically invest in any kind of new process risk. So, you know, they would have had to get pretty comfortable that, you know, this thing's going to work for them to to uh, deploy some capital here. So, yeah. So we'll see what we'll see what happens. OK, one well, to keep an eye on, guys. Uh, and then we're going to leap over to um, Azura uh, Minerals. Um, we've talked, I think we've talked about them once before. How, how yeah, we've talked about, about them before. And, you know, and again, this is one that, you know, that I spoke positively of in terms of, you know, they, they had a number of targets. Um, they seem to be drilling them in, in, a, in a proper way with the proper size step outs rather than sort of yep. purely promotional retreading stuff. Um, and, you know, again, got some nice, you know, some of the better intervals they've got to date, four meters at 3% plus nickel with some copper and cobalt that go along there. You know, that's kind of starting to get the grades wise comparable to Nova Bollinger. Be nice to see the widths get a little bit wider from here. But, you know, mm -hmm. again, it's, it's a, it is a new project. And so it takes a, takes a while for you to figure out exactly, you know, how deposits are sitting and so forth. But they're, you know, they're doing a good job. Uh, they've done the network, first stage network. Again, these types of nickel sulfides, you know, usually, um, the, the key here is that there's no nasties in, in the material and that they said earlier there weren't any nasties and if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't occur in the ore, generally it doesn't occur in the concentrate either, you know, and that was the case. But, but I think the one thing is the results there, you know, they um, have two options of either making a nickel copper cobalt, uh, nick, nickel or copper concentrate, making two concentrates or making one bulk one. Um, and it, again, it just highlights, uh, you know, the challenges, you know, yes, you've got good grade, but you know, the, the, the difficulty is, you know, that combined concentrate is only 12% combined nickel, nickel copper. Um, when they, they try and make it separately, they can get the nickel up to 16% nickel, you know, which is good. That would be at the upper end of, of, of the range. But, you know, you end up, uh, you know, getting only about 79% of the nickel into that standalone there. And then you end up with, you know, you know, uh, still have still having some copper in there, which you're not going to get full value for from the smelters. So, um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's the challenge with the sort of mixed nickel copper higher grade deposit that you see out there is to, to make sure the nickel gets, you know, you're going to get paid for all the nickel and copper you produce. Okay. I, I can see, I can see the theme this way. There's a very technical competence of management teams to yeah. extract full value. Um, we're going to, we're going to actually talk in a bit, um, very quickly. So I spoke with, um, the guy Centaurus, um, mm -hmm. the CEO of Centaurus, I think Friday, it must have been Friday. Yeah. One really good guy. You've always been very positive about their company and, and their project. Um, you know, enjoyed that conversation with him. Um, I think they, I think, I think, what was I saying? I think I'm, I'm trying to struggle to remember. I think it was scale. They need to demonstrate scale because that's perhaps the kind of missing piece to this. And he's, he's sort of sure that the drilling that they're going to be doing will be able to do that. So I enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, no, they're continuing to build out the resource there. You know, again, there's sort of multiple deposits and, you know, they, they inherited a smaller resource from, um, but st smaller, but still fairly sizable for a yeah. sulfide resource, um, yeah. you know, and they've done a good job of expanding the footprint, you know, of a bunch of these deposits at surface and then down at depth. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the next resource update is. But, you know, again, that's, you know, as people who've watched these ones, you know, is something, you know, is one that, uh, you know, been generally pretty positive on as, as it's moved forward. <laughs> I kind of liked it because it was like uh, they, they kind of came across it by accident because the iron ore project didn't work out. So it's one of those yeah. ones where, you know, good, good guys, sometimes things don't work out and you've got to quickly segue or move to something that, that does. We've seen that a, cu a couple of times. It doesn't always look good initially, but the, I think they've, they've, um, they've done well there. The, the, well, the, 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 drilling has, the drilling has spoken. No, and it's a good, I mean, to me, it underscores in this business, you know, the, the importance of advancing projects and pushing them forward because, again, in the process of pushing them forward and being active, it sometimes creates other opportunities that, you know, yeah. that you, you know, you didn't, uh, you know, you didn't really think about. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it was, I mean, for them, that was, that was a great trade. They gave back, they took a iron, iron or iron or copper project, gave it back to, 
Valley and they took the nickel project out of Valley at almost exactly the, you know, the most, the bottom of the recent Perfect market. Timing. So they timed it. They timed that, uh, that perfectly. So, so like I say, mining, it's a lot about timing. It's a lot about luck being in the right place, the right time, and then you got to execute. So uh, a lot of moving parts. Um, and we're going to sort of finish off with uh, Eco Pro. So we've talked about them in the past, South, um, South Korean. Uh, what are they up to? So, so you know, again, just to underscore that, you know, they, they, they've got a, a joint venture with Blackstone Minerals, which, you know, I think is, is to me, the, you know, what, the, what you're going to see much more of is a nickel comes in one door, battery precursor comes out the back door of the plant. Um, and so they just signed a deal with one of the big uh, battery makers in uh, Korea for $8 billion uh, over three years. So, you know, that, that's a lot of nickel and that's a lot of battery. So I think just again, underscore this, this size of, of how these things are going to go. And so, you know, um, you know, they're going to need a lot more nickel um, beyond just what to, you know, what they're going to be getting um, from that Blackstone venture. So, um, you know, which is great. And, and again, you know, the, the, given this is the first week back and need to do the market update, you know, I think, you know, next week I'll have some more company news because there was a bunch of stuff come out for the, for the various conferences that got started off uh, in September because it's conference season. It's, once again. It's, it's a big couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. Obviously um, conferences, Last week we got conference. This week Colorado, and they're the two of the better ones. I gotta yep. say, you know, you're, yep. you're, you're at, you've obviously uh, doing it virtually uh, this this year. Or did you do it virtually last year as well? Uh, it was, virtually? No, I don't. I I don't know if they. I think they were they doing have. virtual. They were. Yeah, I can't remember because we yeah we didn't we didn't go last year. We, we were yeah. Little early stage, and it's primarily gold focused. But you know, we had yeah. enough market presence that we were, um, you know, looking at going going this year as well too. But uh, yeah. um, I spoke. I spoke I to a couple of folks at the weekend. Concept. I spoke to a couple of folks at the weekend. Actually, actually did one yeah. interview over the weekend. She's sitting on his sofa, just showing me right. around. It's <laughs> great. Um, and I think the general sentiment is people are just relieved to be you know sitting face to face, which is, which is yeah. great. But you got to do it safely. So some, I think a lot of Canadian companies that had booked to go ended up doing it virtually because the there's it's in a kind of you know it's in a red zone. Um, yeah. And but the people who went said it was fantastic, and you know people were you know talking and chatting and, and doing things the right way. Not all conferences yeah. are good. So it's quite a few are a waste of time. Uh, and then this week, um, I'm actually meant to be there, but the UK has said that you can't go. We're not allowed to travel. Yeah which is a shame because I was looking forward to meeting a few, few guys and gals. And obviously we're looking at um, investing in a, in a couple of deals in the States at the moment, but uh, that's on hold. Well, not the investing, but the visit is on hold. Yeah. It's such a shame. Yeah. But, no, no, I was supposed to be at a battery conference next week uh, in Berlin that Metal Bulletin was hosting on next week in two weeks. Metal yeah. Bulletin was hosting. They've just, they've just canceled it. You know, again, I guess, um, right, there, yeah. There's enough hesitancy of, of of people moving around, so that's been postponed to another date. But uh, yeah. they are going to go ahead with uh, targeting going ahead with a Fair Alloys conference in November. So hopefully uh, that does go go ahead because it would it is good to get a chance to meet more people face to face for sure. So. It's kind of a weird when I hate I hate getting these conversations about COVID, but it, it, it just I think that's that point where you, there are red zones, but they're of a certain age group and of a certain you know you know, personnel, as it were. I think most adults in Canada, most adults in the U well, US, bar 80, 80 million of them, let me take that back, you know, have had two jabs. And, you know, I think we've kind of got, got a, well, I'm certainly looking forward to being able, able to travel given the amount of, you know, effort we've gone to, to, you know, get vaccinated and do tests and and, and, and so forth. It's a, it's a shame that they're canceling conferences still, but... There we I'm go. hoping to be over for LME week in the uh, in the second week of, of October. So maybe we can actually do an in-person interview for the first time since uh, I think we did our first one back. Oh, uh, it was about two years ago. Uh, yeah, this, this, that's this, this, this week. So that's insane. I'm going to have to get out some some good wine. We'll there do we some go. B Y O, and I will B Y O some good stuff. Uh, okay. now, well, I hope you I hope you get over, Mark. So it'd be good to see you. Um, you know, and, and uh, get on with the business of doing business. Okay, Mark, well, like, great, great week. Thanks for the summary uh, of what's going on out there. Glad you're back. Glad the nickel market continues to roar off as it does. And even Elon 
Mask cannot dampen our spirits. There we go. Exactly. You know what's good when. All right, take care, sir. We'll talk next week.